Amen. Thank you, Tom. Like Tom said, my name is Andrew, and I get the privilege of leading our college ministry here called The Salt Company, and I love that I get to do that for a job. It's my favorite thing. If you are not there already, you can turn to Matthew chapter 13. That's where we're going to be at. We've been in the book of Matthew basically the entire year so far in Tree Line, and we're continuing there. But while you guys are turned there, I just want to tell you just a quick story. Um, this happened a few years ago when I was engaged to my now wife, Laura. And engagement is this incredible time of life. I loved our engagement. Laura and I had a little foster baby during that engagement, so it was a little unorthodox, but it was awesome. And engagement, basically, it's this sweet time where you're trying to spend as much time as you possibly can with one another. Like, you're going on walks, you're doing all these things that I never did before I had a girlfriend or a fiance, and I just went for runs. I didn't know what walking was for. So anyway, <laughs> Laura introduced that into my life, and it was great. Uh, so I loved going on walks with her, and one day in particular, we were going on on a walk, and like Laura does, she stops to look at different plants or trees or flowers and stuff. I never stopped for these things. I didn't care that much. I'm more of like a point A to point B type guy, just get it done. But Laura adds much beauty and nuance to my life in many ways. This is one of them. Uh, so she stops and she's looking at this flower, and I'm like, all right, I know the drill. Feign a little interest for a little bit, smile and nod. Oh, yeah, look at the colors. It's great. And we'll get back to the walk. Except. On this day, Laura introduced me to a new type of flower, a flower that I had never seen before, and I connected with this flower on a level I didn't know was possible with vegetation. All right, so we get to this flower. She's like, come look at it, and it is amazing. It's got this little, like, canopy thing and this little, almost like bench. There's, like, streaks of white in it and this little, like, bulb in the middle of the flower. It was incredible, and then she told me the name of the flower, Jack in the pulpit. I'm like, oh my word, this is great. Jack's in his pulpit, Andrew's in the pulpit. He's a preacher, like we can get on together. Like this is super cool. Finally, a flower that I can get behind. And so here's the thing, going into marriage with Laura, I knew that I was gonna have to step up my plant game a little bit. I had never owned a plant. I had never watered a plant. I didn't know anything about plants. Laura is a big plant person, and so I'm like, I need to learn how to keep our plant children alive. Otherwise, how am I gonna keep our real children alive? So I was like, man, maybe this could be my thing. And then Laura told me that her dad, my father-in-law, Doug, actually had some of these flowers, these jack-in-the-pulpits, growing at their house up in Minnesota. I'm like, this is amazing. I'm going to go up there. I'm going to get a bulb. My first thing I ever grow is going to be a jack-in-the-pulpit. I'm going to raise up a little preacher. It'll be great. And so we go up to Minneapolis. I get the bulb. Her father, like my father-in-law, Doug, is like an expert gardener. And so he's teaching me all these like tips and tricks, gives me the bulb. I take it. I come back down to Iowa. I plant it. And I got to be honest guys, the first couple weeks that I'm growing this thing, I crushed it. Like absolutely this plant is in like the prime spot on the windowsill, plenty of sunlight. I potted it in a pot that was like right size. It had drainage at the bottom. Uh, apparently that's good for it. I was watering it, but like not too much. I was speaking words of affirmation over this thing. I was like gassing it up. I was just like going to town, plant father of the year. All right, and so a couple days go by and it finally shoots up out of like the little ground that I had it in. And it was amazing. I'm like, it's doing it. It's working. I'm growing it. I'm like doing all this stuff. And so I FaceTime Doug. I'm like, hey, look, is yours sprouted yet? And he's like, yeah, look, mine's out of the dirt too. And it was like maybe an inch or two high, like the little green sprout, the stalk was beginning to form. And I was so excited. This was happening. A couple more days go by, maybe another week. And I'm like, you know, he, uh, he kind of looks the same that he looked a few, a few weeks or a few days ago. It's like, maybe he's just slow. Maybe he's like a, a late bloomer. And so I let another week go by, still no change. I let another like four or five days. I'm like, all right, something's going on here. Like he looks exactly the same as he was two weeks ago. Like the excitement wears off. Let me FaceTime Doug and see what he has to say. So I was like, hey, hey, how's your like Jack in the pulpit doing, Doug? Like uh, mine, like, I don't really know. He's like, I think pretty good. And he turns the camera to his Jack in the pulpit. And this thing is ridiculous. Like absolute mega church sanctuary, all right? Vaulted ceilings, stained glass windows, a pulpit that was ornate. Charles Spurgeon would have loved to preach out of this thing. Full bloom, all right? All the colors, all everything. This thing is good to go. I was like, dude, mine's barely a church plant. It's just a little nub still. Like, I think something went wrong. And he's like, yeah, definitely something went wrong with it. He's like, hey, do me a favor real quick. Just grab the top and just, just give it a little pull for me. I was like, all right, I can do that. And so I grab the top of this plant. I give it just the like littlest pull ever. 
and boom, out of the soil. <laughs> no roots, no nothing. I had planted it like half an inch under the soil because I thought the sunlight still needed to get to the seed <laughs> for it to grow. So no roots, no chance of this thing growing. Jack's dead, I'm a murderer. My father-in-law probably has a lower like perspective of me. This plant went nowhere, all right? What was wrong with the plant? Was there anything wrong with the seed? No. Was there anything wrong with the original sower, Doug? No, his instructions were good. What was wrong? It was the soil. Some of you are like, no, 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 the soil was fine. You were the problem. It's like, all right, fair enough, maybe that. But in actuality, the environment I put the seed in was totally incapable of fostering the life that the seed was supposed to happen in. You see, this story is actually kind of like the story that Jesus tells this morning. It's similar to me in the plant, but unlike my incident, in this case, there's no problem with the seed and definitely no issue with the sower. The issue is with the soil. And so this parable, it's called the parable of the soil, and it's a little bit misleading in its name. It's called the parable of the sower, but really it should be called the parable of the soils because though the sower is the only character, he is not at all the focal point. This story is way more about the soil that the seed falls into rather than the sower or the seed. There's no problem with the seed, no issue with the so sower. It's the soil we're talking about. And that's really crucial for understanding this story that Jesus tells us this morning, that there's no issue with the seed. The seed's good to go. It's never a question if the seed is faulty. And there's no question about the sower either. He's a perfect sower. He's a good farmer. The issue is with the different soils. And here's the other thing about this story. This story, it's a parable. And in fact, we're about to hear a lot of parables of Jesus. We're kind of getting into this section of his life and in this book of Matthew where Jesus is going to tell us a number of stories that are parables. And what's true about this parable is true about them all, is that parables are earthly stories with a heavenly meaning. They're earthly stories with a heavenly meaning. They're physical examples of spiritual realities. And so when Jesus tells us stories like this, it's absolutely critical that we understand not just what he says, but what he means. And not just the story he tells, but the things that it's about, because ultimately, this story in particular, it is not about soils, it's about you. This parable about the different kinds of dirt, it's not about soils, it's about your soul. And Jesus told this story with a purpose. It's meant to teach us about the condition and the environment of our heart. This is a very spiritual, very like soul, like looking at type thing, which might be a little weird for you. If you're not very much into like existential processing or like viewing yourself with this like meta spiritual analysis, here's the only thing I mean by that, is that every single one of us, when we hear the message of Jesus or when we read the Bible, we have an initial reaction to that. Every single one of us, regardless if you grew up in the church, regardless if you would call yourself a follower of Jesus or not, every single one of us, when we hear about Jesus, when we hear teachings from his word, that lands a particular way with us. We either choose to do something with it or we don't, we like it, we don't like it. That environment, how does it land? That's what Jesus is talking about. That's the condition of our heart. And the reason that Jesus wants to talk to us about that is because there is a type of environment that his message needs to land in if it's ever going to take root and change our lives. The reason Jesus talks to us about this is because there's a, a specific, there's like a right answer. There's a specific type of environment that is needed for Jesus's message and his kingdom to take place in our life. And here's the thing, all of us should like really, really want that to happen. Because Jesus is a really, really good king. And the thing he offers us is not just a new set of rules to follow or a new way to spend your time. It's actually a new life altogether. You see, what Jesus promises to every single person that would come to him is that their life would be full of joy and full of peace and full of generosity and full of love. All of these things are the things Jesus wants to like stir up inside of us. And for that to happen, we need to be a certain type of people. You see, these soils describe actual conditions of real life people, one of which you are, one of which I am. 
And so here's the question we're asking this morning. What soil are you? What soil are you? In other words, what is the type of environment that Jesus finds when his word comes into your life? What soil are you? Let's look at this parable together. Matthew chapter 13, starting in verse three, or maybe verse one. I might have wrote that down wrong, either way. And he told them many things in parables saying, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, he sowed and some seeds fell along the path and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil. And immediately they sprang up since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched. And since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among thorns and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain. Some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. He who has ears, let him hear. That's the whole parable. That's all of it. And in fact, this is probably one of the more well-known stories and parables that Jesus told. So maybe you've heard it before, but even if you haven't, it's not that hard for us to know what's going on here, right? And for the people listening who lived in a primarily agricultural society, it was even easier for them to understand what was going on. They didn't have to like imagine what Jesus was talking about. They just had to look around at the fields that surrounded their towns and their lives. And so let's break it down. We have a few pieces here. The sower, that's Jesus or God. He is the one that sends his message, that sends his kingdom into the world. The sower is Jesus. You have the seed and the seed, that's his word. It's the message of the gospel or the message of the kingdom of God. It's like, this is my message. This is what it is. He's sending it out. That's the seed. And it falls into four types of soils. Did you catch what they were? Four types. The first three are bad. It's like the soil that I made for my little jack in the pulpit. Didn't work out so well. So three bad soils. The first one is you got the path, which is too packed down and hard for the seed to go even down to. You've seen paths next to fields that are like walked on or treaded on. It's too hard. The seed doesn't even go down into it. You've got the rocky soil, which if you know anything about topsoil, which maybe if you're from Iowa, there's a higher chance of that like I am, but topsoil, eventually you get down and there's like bedrock beneath it. Sometimes that bedrock is so high that you can't plant anything in it because the roots of plants can't get down. Or maybe there was just a bunch of rocks mixed into it and the roots couldn't spread out. Either way, the rocky soil is bad soil. You can have no roots in it. And number three, you've got the thorny soil, which it did produce a plant, but there were other things growing in that soil too, weeds, and the weeds and thorns choked it out. Three bad soils. Nothing wrong with the sower. No issues with the seed. Just three soils that couldn't sustain the life that was literally dropped into their lap. And then the parable lands, and it lands on the good soil. What did it say? It said, other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some 60, and some 30. So you have now the good soil, which the seed was not only able to fall down into, but there was nothing in that soil that was preventing the growth. The soil had space for and facilitated the growth of this plant, and it bore much fruit. The plant had its way and accomplished its task in the good soil. All right, so that's the picture. You kind of get the gist of it, right? Three bad soils, one good soil, plants growing up. What does it mean? How does that actually apply to us? And why does Jesus choose to compare his kingdom to a seed in a garden? Why does that matter to us? Why would Jesus, of all the things he could have chosen in this world, why did he choose a seed and a plant to represent him in his kingdom? I think the reason that Jesus compared his kingdom to a seed is that so it would be so blatant and so unmistakably clear to us that his kingdom is different than the kingdoms of the world. You see, Jesus's kingdom, it doesn't come with swords and cannons. It comes with truth and love. Jesus's kingdom is one that grows slowly and creates new life. It doesn't come and steal, kill, and enslave. Think about it for a minute. Think how earthly kingdoms actually get established here on earth. There's wars, there's blood, there's kings that send, army and send armies forth and stake their flag in the ground. That's how it works. People conquer, they kill, they enslave. That's how kingdoms go forward. Even in the business world, the people who have money and power, they pay for advertisements. 
And even in a democracy, we're not like that different, right? Like still 49% of the population doesn't vote for the current president. But when they like get in office, 49% of people have to submit to that. Kingdoms go through power, wealth, and influence in this world. Jesus' kingdom is different. You see, every one of those kingdoms becomes a kingdom by exerting power and aggression and force onto other people. Jesus' kingdom begins in you. And it's kind. And it's gentle. And it's not harsh. It starts within you and it changes you from the inside out. And slowly but surely, it brings new life and growth and joy and peace. Jesus' kingdom is different. Now, I don't know if that's what you thought the message of Christianity was. Maybe you thought the message of Christianity was come and do all these good things and maybe you'll be good enough one day. Maybe you thought like the message of Christianity was conform and be like this certain group of people and then you can belong. I'm telling you the message of Christianity is come and be changed from the inside out. Come and know your God and let him build something new inside of you that is amazing and beautiful and worthwhile. That's the message of our kingdom. And Jesus, he's trying to make you the type of soil and the type of person that can sustain that type of growth. Think about it for a minute. Jesus literally wants to make you the type of person that can naturally be like him and live the perfect life he lived, full of joy, full of peace, full of grace, Don't you want to be like that? That's the thing Jesus is trying to build up and grow inside of you. And because of that, we have to create an environment where that's actually possible. That sort of message, that sort of kingdom, it needs space. It needs the right environment. And if we're not ready for it, we're going to miss it completely. You see, we're not naturally the people that are most conducive to like cultivating perfection inside of us, right? That's not exactly what humanity is known for is being perfect and cultivating all these like really good natural attributes. And so Jesus, knowing that this was true about humanity, gives us some warnings about what goes on in our heart and how to avoid those things. And so that's why he explains the different types of soil. Let's look at how he explains the different soils. Verse 18. He says, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is what was sown along the path. So we're back to the path here, back to soil number one. And Jesus is trying to give us some insight. He's literally saying, that there will be some people incapable of and unable to receive this message because their hearts, like the path, are too hard. He says, this person who has a heart that is hard, he says, this is the person who doesn't understand the message. And now that sounds a little bit harsh off the bat, right? Like just somebody who doesn't understand, that seems unfair. Like if someone hears it, but they just can't understand it or they're trying really hard, but for whatever reason, it's not clicking, then they just don't get in. They don't have access to this thing. That's a little bit different than what Jesus is actually saying. You see, that phrase in the original language of the Greek literally means to consider or to work to put together. And so the picture we're given is not someone that is confused, but someone who refuses the message altogether. The picture is not of someone who's working really hard to understand it and just not getting it. It's of somebody who doesn't want to be bothered by this message who hears some pieces and just refuses to put them together. Maybe they let some of the intellectual ideas of Christianity roll over their mind, but they never take it to heart. They never personalize it. They never really think to themselves, is this for me? Like, let this sink deep. They merely dismiss it altogether or treat this message as a mere intellectual thought and totally ignore the profoundly personal element of this kingdom. Are you this type of soil? Are you the type of person that whenever Jesus or the Bible or even like vaguely spiritual things come up in conversation, your initial reaction is to recoil, avoid, get angry, or dismiss? Is that you? See, the question that Jesus has for you this morning is simply to ask yourself, why is that? What about Christ and his message really is the reason that you react in the way you do? And some of you are like, 
dude, what do you mean, why do I react? I've got a bunch of questions. <laughs> like, how do we even know we can trust the Bible? Or you think God created the world, what about science? You think Jesus performed all these miracles, like, what about this? Or like, you said Jesus come back from that, like, my heart is hard because my head is full of questions. And if that is where you're at this morning, I just wanna say, praise God, I'm glad you're here. This is actually a really good church and a really awesome community to be a part of if you are struggling with intellectual ideas about Christianity. I'm telling you, we love those questions around here and we love people who have questions. We don't think following Jesus is antithetical to intellectual ideas or reasoning or things like that. Like, I love dialoguing about those things. Please come to us. Ask your questions. They are welcome here. And at the same time, I wanna ask this question. If you made a list of every intellectual hurdle you have with Christianity and I gave you a satisfactory answer for all of them, if I answered every single one of your questions in like a pretty like to like very reasonable way, would you actually be ready to be following Jesus or is there something else holding you back? Seriously, just think real quick. What are like the one or two or three like intellectual questions that you have put sort of put up as walls or hurdles against Christianity if you actually had satisfactory answers to those questions? If we could actually check those off for you, would you actually be ready to follow Jesus as your Lord or is there something else going on in your heart? I'm telling you, your questions are welcome here. We love them. We want to talk about them. But again and again, I have found myself in conversations with people and relationships with people that even when their questions are answered, they are still angry. Even when their questions are answered, they are not ready to follow Jesus because there's something much deeper going on. Is that you? If Christianity is only ever an intellectual exercise that you roll around in your mind, but never confront with your life, then you will never reach the right conclusions. You cannot get to like the center of this faith and what it's actually about by logical reasoning or solving some equation. It's way more personal than that. It's way too real to just be this some ethereal thing on a sheet of paper. It is the person of Jesus Christ and a person you have to be in a relationship with. You cannot get to it only by intellect. If your heart is hard, meaning you won't open yourself up to this message actually being real or applicable to you, then you will miss it because Jesus is too polite to force his way in. He will not beat you over the head with this belief. He will simply drop the seed to you and say, do you want it? And if you don't take it in, then Satan will take it away. If you don't take it in, Satan will take it away. That's the bird taking in the path. You see this seed, it's in your lap. But if you won't take it into your heart, if you won't consume it to the depths of who you are, Satan will come and take it away forever. If you don't take it in, Satan will take it away. That's the hard soil. Now, what's the next soil he talks about? Look at verse 20. He says, as for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while, and when tribulation or persecution arises on the count of the word, immediately he falls away. So this rocky soil, this is the type of person who has a faith, but it's a faith that's shallow. It's a faith that's based on some emotionally charged situations and a faith that has no foundation in Christ. You see, this soil in particular is one of the most heartbreaking ones for me because I don't know about you, but immediately a list of names comes to my mind of people who seem like they fit this description. I have multiple names of people that were deep, deep Christian friends in college that now want nothing to do with Jesus and are in no way following him. This passage explains what happens. And it doesn't make it less sad, but it does make it a little bit comforting that Jesus provides some clarity. He's saying, I knew this was gonna happen. I knew some people would get really excited about something for a little bit and then walk away. Again, the issue isn't with the sower and it's not with the seed, it's with the soil. So I had this one friend who, and I was trying to think how to describe this one friend and here's the best way I can describe him. He is everything you imagine when you imagine a guy in a fraternity named Chad. 
All right, that's this guy. His name wasn't Chad, but it should have been Chad. Like, every, sorry if your name is Chad, but like, this is what it is. Fraternity Chad and everything that comes with that, that was this dude. And he, I love that dude, loved that dude then, still do now. He was awesome. The dude was reckless. Oh my word. Some of the stories he would come back with after his weekends out doing like Lord knows what was incredible. And so we just loved having him around. We'd always invite him to salts, to different things. Like, man, if this guy ever came to know Jesus, it would be amazing. And eventually we wore him down. He came to salt with us and we were like, yeah, he's probably not going to love this. Like, you know, whatever. And, and he did. He was like, dude, is is that real? Like, I mean, I think it is like, I'm following Jesus. Like, so I brought you here and, and he come back another week and a few weeks he comes back. And I remember the night that he put his hand up and said, I'm ready to follow Jesus. And you guys, the next months of his lives were incredible. I mean, he was so excited about Jesus. He was the greatest evangelist in all of Salt Company. And he knew very little of what he was talking about, but it didn't matter. He was just like out there trying to get people in and he was joining Bible studies. He was like leading other guys like to Christ. He was sharing with his frat brothers. He was saying no to all this sin. It was amazing, you guys. Like Salt Company was electric because this guy and kind of his crew that he was running with started to know Jesus and then... Winter break happened and he went home and he left and the first salt company comes back in the new year and he's not there. And we're like, hey man, like, like miss you, see you next week or whatever, no response. Didn't come again the next week and we're like, dude, what's up, man? Like, salt's still going, Jesus is still cool, right? Like, you know, and, and nothing. And a couple weeks go by and we realized he had blocked all of our numbers Everybody who had ever loved him and opened up their life to him the past few months to teach him about Jesus, just gone. And we were like, why? A few months later, we learned that over Christmas break, as he was like wrestling with Jesus, he realized that some of the illegal ways that he was making money may have to go if Jesus was gonna continue to be his Lord. Over Christmas break, he realized that if he was gonna continue to follow Jesus, then maybe taking a different girl home every weekend to sleep with wasn't gonna fit anymore. And as he sort of like sat over Christmas break and contemplated what his new life in Jesus would look like, things were getting scorched up in the heat. But here's the thing. Here's what that revealed about him. It revealed that the things he really loved were the things he lost in the sun, not Jesus himself. You see, that's what's true about this passage. See, it's really easy to get really excited about Jesus. See, his life was filled with shame. All the reckless things he did, he needed a savior and he knew it. He was carrying a low level guilt and shame and he came to Saul and week in and week out, we preached the message that we're gonna preach here again and again that Jesus saves no matter what. There is no guilt, there is no shame, that is true. And he felt that and yet at the same time, that might mean that we actually have to say no to some of the things that characterized our old life as we begin to follow Jesus. And this guy, he loved the idea of a savior that forgives him. He did not love that savior more than he loved these other things. And when it was gonna cost him that, he left. I'm telling you, this parable was profoundly comforting to us because it taught us what happened to my friend. There's no problem with the soil, no, no issue with the seed, just the soil that was shallow. See, rocky soil is a faith that's built on only emotional moments and no real faith in Jesus. Here today and gone tomorrow. That's soil number two. Soil number three, verse 22. It says, as for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke out the word and it proves unfruitful. Soil number three is the thorny soil. And so here's the thing. The first two are pretty obvious, right? Like we know people who don't respond to the gospel at all. Maybe you're even there. You're like, yeah, I'm I'm soil number one. I don't really know what I think about this. Like message not going deep. Like I wouldn't even call myself a Christian. That's fine. Soil number two is pretty obvious too. They come to Jesus for a little bit. Doesn't work out for them. They don't want to give up anything else. They want Jesus plus the world. So they leave. They wouldn't call themselves Christians either. Pretty obvious. This one is a little bit, more diag- little bit more difficult to diagnose, both in the church and in your own life, because this soil is way more subtle. Because the people who are this soil do in fact have faith. You have faith in Jesus. You have a plant in the ground, right? It said the plant, it took root and it sprang up. What they're struggling with is that there are other things in the soil too. You have a plant, 
You have roots, your faith is in Jesus. There are just some other things in the garden as well competing for it. And at a minimum, their fruit is being choked out. And worst case scenario is that after years and years of being in this soil, the plant itself will die. To quote Tim Keller about this specific soil, it says, some of you have put your faith in Jesus for salvation. You really have, and that's a really good thing. But you have yet to fully believe that the only way you will ever be holy and happy is to actually make Jesus Lord of every area of your life. That's this soil. It's like, yes, my faith is in Jesus. I do trust him for salvation. I'm not just looking for a quick fix. I'm not just looking for an emotional moment. Jesus Christ is my savior. And yet I wanna hold on to some other things. I want Jesus's plant in my garden, but I want a few things to grow alongside of them that I'm not willing to give up. And these weeds, they can look like so many different things. And not even bad things. Honestly, like some of these weeds can be really, really good things that if you let them compete with Jesus, they will choke him out. Weeds can look like different things. Maybe you can't get off of Zillow dreaming about the dream house you think you have to have to be happy. You can't take your eyes off your next project, either at your house or at work. Your investment or banking apps are the most used apps on your screen time. You won't physically or metaphorically let go of your children because you have to have control over them. You're pursuing endless wealth, more education, more hobbies, more news, more political debates, debates, and your life is full. You love Jesus. You really, really do, and yet you are tired. You really love Jesus, and you actually think this message is true, and at the same time, you really feel like it's just not working. You feel exhausted. You feel worn out from trying to live this life and hold on to Jesus. You see, this soil is the most miserable of all the soils. It's miserable because you do love Jesus, and so you wake up early on Sunday to go to church. You do love Jesus, and so you do the things that Christians are supposed to do, but you're exhausted because you're seeing no fruit. You're exhausted because your life isn't marked by the peace that Jesus said it would be marked by. You're tired because your life is far more ruled by fear than by faith. You've left too many things in your garden and, you're, and there's not enough room for what Christ is really trying to do in you. Remember what Jesus is preparing you for. What he is trying to give you is literally alive and living and it needs space to grow. He's not simply giving you a new moral code or a new set of beliefs or a list of habits and rules to follow. He's building inside of you a new creation, brand new life that needs space to grow. See, here's the thing about Jesus's kingdom. It grows slowly, but it only grows where it's wanted and it only goes where it has space. Do you want God and God alone? because that's what's gonna get rid of your weeds. The thorny soil is distracted soil. God's kingdom is but one plant in the garden and it's not getting the nutrients or sunlight it needs because you're tending to the weeds around it. Soil number three is distracted soil, which leaves us with one more soil, the good soil. Look at verse 23. As for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another 60, and in another 30. So this good soil, this is the soil that receives the word of God with eagerness and bears fruit. Here's what I love about the good soil. Here's what I love about like the one fruit where the kingdom of God can actually grow. All it takes to actually be this good soil is just a heart that says, Jesus, I want you and nothing else. All it takes to actually be a good soil is not do all this gardening, is not get rid of everything, is not do this like list of things to get ready. It's simply be a soil that says, Jesus, I want your word. Jesus, I have nothing else. I am tired, come give me rest. Jesus, I am weary, come give me strength. That's all it takes to be the good soil. They say, Jesus, if I have you and nothing else, that's enough for me because that's all I want. I am receptive and eager to the word of God. All it takes 
to get Jesus in that way and really get his message is to go to him and say, I want whatever you have to say to me. And you guys, this good soil, it can look like so many different things. And I wanna be really encouraging this morning because I actually think there is good soil all over this church. In fact, I just wanna list a couple of examples of good soil. Tony Lynn over here is good soil. Here's how I know Tony is good soil. Amen, yes. <laughs> Tony has read the Bible approximately 17,000 times more than I've read the Bible. <laughs> Tony has preached more sermons than I've ever listened to in my entire life, and yet, week in and week out, Tony is my biggest encourager as a preacher. Because Tony doesn't come here to hear from Andrew. Tony comes here to hear from the word of God. And every single week we open up this Bible, Tony has a heart that says, I want to hear God. What is God going to say to me? I'm ready. I'm eager. You guys, he's been following Jesus for decades. I want to be like that. I never want to lose my hunger and my receptivity to the word of God. It's changing his life. That's Tony. I could talk about Jesse Langmire, who's in medical school right now. And she came to David and Laura, my wife who works on staff, Laura and David, our lead pastor, to ask for advice on like what path she should take in medical school. They don't know anything about surgery. They don't know like what like the best course is to take or whatever. Here's what they do know. They know their Bibles and they know how to pray. And Jesse didn't just want professional advice. She wanted spiritual advice. Even in a decision like that, she wanted to know what does God want for me? What does God's word say about my career path? She came to them because she was hungry. That's good soil. I think about Andrew and Morgan Campbell, who are new to our church. They were sitting on our back deck, hanging out the other day, and Andrew referenced the very first sermon he ever heard at Treeline and how it's shaping the way he thinks about his family life and interacting with them. You guys, I was blown away by that. They were new to our church. It was the very first Sunday. They didn't wait to see if I was cool. They didn't wait to see if this church was like where they were gonna stick. They were there to hear from the word of God. They didn't know me. They didn't know if I was a good teacher. They didn't know anything. They knew that the word of God was open and they were ready to receive. And already Andrew was like, that is changing the way I think about my real life circumstances. That's good soil. Soil that says, I don't care how I get it. If it's from the Lord, I want it. Even if it's not what I want to hear, I know it's what I need. I'm going to Jesus, tree line, be the good soil. Which soil are you? For the rest of my days, I want to be a man and a person that is wide open for Jesus and his kingdom to come into and say, I want that more than I want anything else. I want to be the type of person that Jesus is allowed to grow fruit inside of me. I wanna be more loving. I wanna be more gracious. I wanna be more patient. That is the thing that Jesus promises to every single one of you who says, I want it. That's all it takes to be the good soils, to go to Jesus and he freely offers it. He died for you on the cross so that everything that might separate you from that reality could be forgiven. And he looks past all of that and says, welcome home. That is what it means to follow Jesus, is to say yes to the thing he's trying to build inside of you. Will you pray with me?